Our world is undergoing profound change. Day or night, from skyscrapers to the countryside, underground and even in space, work defines our lives. Work is meaning. Work is creativity. Work is what defines us. But what about tomorrow? In a digital, ultra-connected world, how will we view our jobs? Soon, the workforce will comprise five generations. How, where, and with whom will we work? We're at the early stages of a fundamental redefinition of what it means to have a job. What types of jobs are going to be available? And that's part of where the debate is. We don't know what types of jobs are going to exist. In 2050, there will be 7 billion people in the job market. Will our occupations follow the path shown by science fiction? What if our future turned out to be very different? The positive outcome is that there will be job destruction, but there will be much job creation. Will digital communication let us work from anywhere? Basically, if you can imagine it and if you can think about it, it's coming. Dreamers are devising future work solutions that are more robotized, flexible, and creative. So it's one attempt to at least investigate how can we walk around our office space remotely. Augmented reality is the next generation of computing. This is really about being in the place, but then making that place magical. In this stage of human evolution, it's important to make non-sitting environments, to generate behavioral change. We had to break the cliché that robots are dangerous. Robots can bring us so many benefits that they have a place among our future colleagues. Our distant ancestors were busy finding food, shelter and protection. More than two million years ago, they started inventing tools and kept improving them. Around 12,000 years ago, populations settled and began to work the land. We began to produce what we needed, and that involved preserving and storing goods. Tasks were divided up, crafts were developed, goods and services were traded. In the 7th century BC, we invented money. Ancient Greeks and Romans reserved work for slaves, while the elite indulged in nobler pursuits. In the Middle Ages, farming became a common occupation. During the Renaissance, another vision emerged. Craftsmen created work that led to self-fulfillment. Work increasingly acquired value within our societies, by the 18th century, for Adam Smith, the father of capitalism, it had become central to the economy. In 1769, James Watt's steam engine 
heralded the Industrial Revolution and the mechanization of labor. The key to mass production was a combination of workers and machines. Having a job enabled you to earn a living and acquire social status until it became the very essence of man with Karl Marx. By the 20th century, productivity was the watchword, as in Henry Ford's factories. This system ensured some workers' rights. Paid vacation and fewer working hours helped establish a work-life balance. Today, computing tools, the internet, and social networks have radically reshaped how we work. And I think that the real key for the future is autonomy and flexibility, that people will have more say about when and where they work, and they'll have more flexibility about the type of work that they decide to do. This flexibility and autonomy will give us wings. In 2050, we will work everywhere on mountaintops, along a riverbank, in the forest, or on the beach. According to a study by Stanford University, nature can boost our productivity by 30%. I think the new synonym when we think about work is gonna be life. Life, work, work, life. Uh, I think it's all fitting together, which is why we call it work-life integration and less about work-life balance. So I definitely think that that's the direction that we're going towards. In the Netherlands, with his fleet of small caravans, Frank Gorder is already well on the road to the future. A road of new adventures, where boundaries between professional and private could vanish. We all have become digital nomads. We can work anywhere we want. So we can decide to go outside, then transform this into our working daily life. You can think about the future in two ways. You can maybe think the future as something where we can find a solution to our problems through technology. But the second way is maybe uh, a way which uh, sort of goes back to an old idea that nature provides us actually already with everything. The Kantoor Caravan is an idea we started about one and a half years ago. We thought it was a good idea to uh, use mobile caravans for offices. It's mobile so we can go to the most remote, beautiful places to be able to combine work with, uh, well, the, the peace and the quietness of nature and the you know, values we normally don't experience in our uh, normal day of work. Being able to work in these places gives inspiration. Uh, you can sit uh, alongside the water in your shorts. I mean, why not? Why is uh, recreation something else as work? And why not combine it a little bit that you can relax and work at the same time. We started uh, the Contour Caravan with the idea that bringing people together uh, in a different context does something with our relationships. Hello. We are working at the beach this week. He, uh, we wondered whether you would be interested in meeting with us at the beach instead of at our boring office. If you have a conversation in this place or in conversation in your own office, I'm sure it will be different. 
So you're able to have a uh, much more direct communication with each other while wearing just your own clothes you normally wear where you find, uh, you, which suit you because you choose them yourself. Got him. Thanks. And in a way, the Kantoor Caravan is being free, is being able to express yourself like you are not at work. If we do become digital nomads, it's because we can now collaborate and work remotely. We are no longer tied to a specific place. The digital age will bring increasing dematerialization. I don't think that we'll see employees working nine to five every single day anymore. We're gonna see a mix of things. Sometimes in the office, sometimes from home, sometimes while they're traveling. Uh, the idea here, it's flexibility. You take work with you regardless of where you are in the world. It's either in your pocket on a smartphone, it's going to be on the goggles that you take with you, but regardless of where you are, you're just going to be able to sit down and work. It doesn't matter where. Flexibility comes from a new tool that eclipses Skype, FaceTime, and other old-school connections. We can be present anywhere, anytime, in the form of VR avatars or holograms. But the flip side is, if we can be present anywhere, so can our boss. Just like Marty McFly's boss. McFly! Fujitsu-san, konnichiwa! McFly! I was monitoring that scan you just interfaced. You are terminated! Terminated? No! No! It wasn't my fault, sir! It was Needles! Needles was behind and the whole you thing! you cooperated! No, I did! It, uh, was, it was a sting operation! I was, I was, I was setting them up! Read my No! Thoughts. Please! No! I cannot be fired! I'm fired! Ah! Queen's University in Canada offers another vision of the future. Get ready for the telehuman. It's an age-old dream, allowing us to be at the office without actually having to go. And I can foresee a future in which people don't necessarily show up at work anymore. They, they, they just telepresence in. But that will only be effective if the telepresence is 100% accurate. I hear someone walking past my office or into the kitchen. Maybe I decide I wanted to just hang out, have a friendly chat. And these kinds of casual interactions where I don't have to set up a network connection, I don't have to call someone, I have to email them in order to know when they're there, are lost. So you're gonna talk to some other people? Yep, yep. Uh, all right, I'll, uh, I'll see you in a bit, okay? A robot has all sorts of connotations. Um, it has to get through thresholds, it can bump into you. Uh, a drone is much more lightweight, can get more places, and allows you to essentially show a person um, roaming your workplace. So it's one attempt to at least investigate how can we walk around our office space remotely without heavy-handed equipment and without, you know, while keeping it lightweight. Well, I started life as a, as a musician, and one of the things I noticed uh, is that you can't really communicate emotions very well with a computer, like you can with a musical instrument. And what I mean by that is uh, like a caress or a touch. A very, the subtlety with which you can play a violin is completely lost in the computer world. That eye contact doesn't just have this emotional effect, it has a very, very important uh, purpose in orchestrating and managing business meetings. So in order to be able to have effective business presentations, 
to be able to negotiate contracts which are very subtle at a distance. It is crucial that we don't just preserve a flat image of your face, but that we actually preserve your entire persona. So the Telehuman is the world's first uh, pseudo-holographic video conferencing experience. I will it so we capture this video of a person in 3D, full surround 3D video, and then project it into a tube, life size. Uh, but what that means is we actually have a virtual camera there, and that virtual camera is connected to your viewpoint. And then as you walk around, the camera, the virtual camera, changes around the model and shows a different, uh, a different side. You can forgive me? Yeah. Okay, great. I'm just going to put you like through. Uh, so, you know, I feel like very privileged in the kid in the candy store it, that we can do this. And we have, we have a lot of satisfaction from just from having the idea. And then we have a lot of satisfaction from seeing the first prototype and it actually works. And it's actually just like we imagined or better. Or there are things that we couldn't even imagine. And oh my God, it's doing that. So it's, it's, a, it's a real privilege being able to do this. Workspaces are crying out for transformation. Most young workers don't want a conventional office. They're determined not to experience this. Need some help? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm looking for a station 15, sector eight. Creatives of all types embody this new wave of independent professionals, a generation that dreams of freer, more open workspaces. In 2050, companies will need to use their imagination to attract workers. Those who provide a safe haven will win the day. Well, I don't think companies of the future necessarily have to create what I like to call Pinocchio's Island, right? It's not just about uh, how do we create free food and free drinks and unlimited perks. Uh, I don't think we need to go that far. When the technology companies think about the future, what you see is an office which has people playing ping pong balls and sleeping in these little nests and maybe coming down on one of these slides. Uh, but the truth is that all those, all those, those are interesting, they're just superficial. If we want to feel good at work, we should listen to our bodies first. All over the world, designers are busy refining the workstations of tomorrow. Standing, lying down, in semi-levitation, why not playing hamsters even? Two brothers in Amsterdam have created an experimental workspace that's halfway between modern art and a science laboratory. It's called the end of sitting. For us, the end of sitting is an, uh, uh, a thinking model. It's a vision on the future that allows people to experience the future. What we want to do is create a kind of art installation that envisions the office of the future. And in this uh, um, vision, the table and the chair doesn't exist anymore. The End of Sitting is a project for a long-term perspective. Uh, it has to change a culture and changing a kind of daily practice costs time because people are used to tables and chairs and they have to switch to a completely new situation. If you work for eight hours a day behind the desk and you travel to your work by car or by public transport, going home, sitting at night behind the te television, you are sitting for 12 hours a, a day. It's extremely bad for your health. 
in this stage of human evolution, it's important to make non-sitting environments, to generate behavioral change and to have people uh, change positions more often. Um, given that we, are so, that we are sitting by default normally, uh, we need to make places, make worlds without chairs. Two years ago, we got a question to think about the office of the future. And we thought, what would it be like having an office environment without the standard archetypes we know, office tables and chairs? And just starting thinking from the human body. So what could you then create a kind of a new office environment uh, starting from the body instead of starting from the perspective of making a building? For us, the well-being of the people working in, the, in, the, in this environment is really important, which is where we've invited empirical researchers to investigate that. And the first indication is that um, people report that this kind of environment is better for their well-being. This kind of environment gets people more playful. Um, it gets people out of the box, out of their conventional ways of working. It breaks the traditional hierarchies. Uh, so it gets people, yeah, uh, more experimental, more playful, and it breaks down the conventional ways of doing things. Uh, I think one of the reasons why people get so playful when they get into this environment is that they, they remember the time that they were kids and were far more active than they are nowadays and were jumping from surface to surface. For sure, what will be clear is that you just are not sitting on one position anymore during the whole day, but that you are continuously moving. The technique is not a problem anymore. It's just your uh, body and the way you are living in this uh, landscape, working in this landscape, together with your colleagues. That it's a kind of new world. It's not just a piece of furniture, but trying to envision a completely new world where everybody is kind of part of. In 2050, after we ditch the desk and chair, we'll be ready to go hands-free. No more laptops, tablets, or smartphones. Gone is the tyranny of the screen. With augmented reality, the computer is everywhere, and we can command it with a wink or a wave. Uh, we're definitely going to see augmented and virtual reality in the workplace. So, you know, you're going to be able to go to a meeting just by flipping down the glasses that you have on, or perhaps these are things gonna, that are already going to be implanted in your eyes, like contact lenses uh, that you could put on. So we're going to see really amazing things come down uh, the pike as far as uh, technology uh, in the workplace. But basically, if you can imagine it and if you can think about it, it's coming. In San Francisco, Alberto Torres is planning this revolution. It will transform our work lives as radically as the computer or the internet. I think with, with augmented reality, we can really change dramatically the actual careers and work that people perform. This is really about being in the place, but then making that place magical. I have personally been aware of augmented reality for, for many years, from movies and, and different uh, uh, research and so forth. But I, when I really realized um, the potential of augmented reality, I was building mobile devices. And we realized that there was a problem with mobile devices. Mobile devices are always too small uh, when you interact with them, and they're always too big when, they're, when you're not. So you want to be able to create 
a rich experience, a very large uh, immersive experience from a very small form factor. And then I realized that, that glasses uh, was a way to create that. Augmented reality is the next generation of computing. The next generation of computing for several things. First of all, we are able to create very rich images, uh, 3D images, large images, multiple screens, uh, all of those in the world around you. Um, second, uh, you're able to interact with it in a very natural way. So you're able to use gestures and voice and head tracking, your, all your movements uh, to interact with the information that you find. And third, it's very contextual. So the, the, the computer knows where you are. It's actually looks, looks, knows what, it, what it's seeing. It's really built around you. Uh, and that creates a, a completely new generation of mobile computing. Augmented reality has the potential to make us all more productive because whatever job you're doing uh, and allow you to do that while you use your hands on, 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 on that job, you can really take a lot of time uh, from the actual job. Another really important thing is you might actually be able to get a job done by someone that has less skill or might not need to, to travel to, um, to a particular location because a person can, can literally see what the, the person in the field is doing uh, and provide very detailed uh, instructions and information to the person con conducting the field there. Therefore, you can save uh, significant amounts of money for many companies. You can imagine, for example, a surgeon uh, that is being augmented uh, through both information and collaboration from third parties to help them uh, save lives and do uh, uh, even more and more complex applications and procedures that they would be able to do otherwise. And hopefully it will also help uh, enhance collaboration and make people work in teams uh, in teams better. So, um, you know, ideally we'll, we'll be driving a, a, a better world for the workers of the future. In 2050, digital technologies are omnipresent we constantly generate our digital footprints. An ever-expanding library of our lives, big data will monitor our work performance. Analyzing this mass of information is a huge task. Big data can help reward results and identify potential. But is it just one step away from Big Brother? So imagine like a, a super advanced version of Siri or uh, Amazon Echo inside of your company that knows everybody that works there uh, and everything that is possible to know about them using big data and analytics, wearable devices. Uh, so you're going to have an enormous amount of data about all of your employees. And through that data, you're going to be able to create and give experiences that they genuinely care about. At MIT in Boston, Sandy Pentland aims to analyze this flood of information. He dreams of making big data a force for good. Well, the part that's interesting about big data is that for the first time, we can actually understand human behavior like never before. The approach we have is, uh, is a very French approach. Uh, it's inspired by the term uh, uh, social physics from uh, Quetla. The idea of applying statistics to human behavior so that we can better understand human behavior. And uh, the sort of thing we do is we build these little name badges like this, right? We have a little bit of electronics on them. And people wear them just like they wear name badges in normal corporations today. Um, except these keep track of where are their conversations. 
They don't record any words or anything like that, but they keep track of when do people talk to each other, who do they talk to. And then what we do is we allow people to see visualizations of the data, not the data itself. So you get to see things like, oh, you know, these groups talk together more than those groups do. So it's a visualization. So you can sort of understand the pulse of the company, the sort of feeling of how things are happening, the, the social environment. And I very quickly realized that there was going to be all this data that people put out and that this was a problem. This sort of social information about, you know, how people interact and so forth is an example of Promethean fire. It could be very, very good. It could really make us much more socially intelligent and happier, but you can also abuse it and make it sort of a big brother, everybody is spying on you type of a thing. And it really comes down to who controls the data. So in, in my future that I want, you control data that it is about you. But the aggregate data, the average data, you know, does this group talk to that group? That's something that the, the company has rights to also. But they shouldn't be able to see, you know, when you go to the bathroom or that you talk to the new secretary a lot or <laughs> things like that, right? So what we've learned about humans and work um, is really grounded in this foraging behavior we see. So um, first of all, when people's habits begin to break down, that usually means that they're under some sort of stress. But more importantly, what it tells us is that success in business is not about uh, the smartest person or the greatest strategy. It's really about the flow of ideas between people. And what we find is by giving this sort of social feedback about the social environment, you can dramatically improve productivity, you can improve innovation, you can also avoid lots of, uh, of very serious mistakes. So the sort of thing that I think about for the future of work is much more empowerment of the individual to find new ideas and bring them in, and much less of the hierarchy that is traditional, much less of the job description that's a fixed description. And of course, that has a lot of social change that goes with it. What if our very relationship with work changed? The culture of freelance work is fast gaining ground. More and more of us are declaring independence, choosing our own projects and workplaces. Thanks to digital platforms, we invent our own occupations and generate our own income. When we think about the worker, we imagine them always being located within a corporation. But actually, when we look to the future, many more jobs are going to be created by people themselves. Freelance work doesn't have the stability, the protections, the sense of like, you know, getting benefits and the fulfillment of the needs of the individual in the same way that full-time employment does. But that doesn't mean that we reject it in favor of full-time employment. What it means is that we have to construct a new social contract around this new model of work. These entrepreneurs live anywhere, from rural India to western cities. They pool know-how and technological resources. I definitely think that the worker of tomorrow is, uh, is going to be more independent and creative and free. As we see this with the maker movement, with Fab Labs, where you can go into an environment, you can work with other people and create things uh, yourself. People's lives have been emptied of work. Work is not a burden, work is not a cross, because work is where we create the world in our everyday lives. In the Paris suburbs, one man dreams of a new relationship with work.
producing objects, sharing skills. It's a way to build community that he practices every day. It all happens at an old industrial site. Fab labs are the quintessence of what's happening in society today with a sharing economy. We have lots of technology to be used by people with very different motivations. It's the wealth of people rather than the diversity of machines that makes Fab Lab. I think the maker culture and fab labs are linked to the fact that we've lost our industrial production capacities. We've lost our factories and our work culture. We've lost workers. We can already see the risks of this roboticized aspect, which could turn us into objects rather than subjects. I think we're all applying a bit of technotherapy, thinking our products are really complex. I've no idea where or how they're made or how I might repair them. Coming here is a way of taking back the means of production. I myself assembled a 3D printer and I think that's almost the alpha and omega of that movement. Before buying the machine, try making the machine yourself. What motivated us was having a receptacle of ideas and creativity that our production process didn't have. When it comes to production, lots of ordinary people have ideas, people who aren't necessarily working for big companies, but who can indeed be useful to society. Here, we're trying to build a model that isn't necessarily monetized, so it's not about paying the people who come, it's about their contribution. It means the whole chain of object design must be done differently, with open source. And the same goes for the available machines which are built on open models. We know the 3D printer, but there's the digital milling machine, the laser cutter, etc. What we do is give these new means of production to people who aren't salaried workers. That approach is central to our project. I think that in 2050, There'll be many such places in lots of towns where people will socialize, uh, pool resources and share production. I grew up in a village and I'm astonished to see that the sharing economy just reinvents the village model. In my village today, there's no longer the trade there was 40 years ago. In cities in 40 years time, they'll have the trade we had in villages 40 years ago. And in 40 years, we'll be forging bonds with a new kind of employee, robots. How will they fit in with us? They'll be everywhere. Factories, warehouses, stores, even hospitals. If you imagine jobs from highly skilled to low skills, then you see that uh, right now those jobs in the middle are being destroyed. Uh, and the reason for that is that uh, AI in particular is able to do any job that's routine. You just have to ask yourself, if you can write down the steps of your job on a piece of paper and hand it to somebody else to do, chances are that job is gonna be automated. Should we fear that these tireless employees with amazing capacities will take our jobs? Will security guards, delivery drivers, and gardeners disappear? Not to mention bank tellers, taxi drivers, even barmen? 
just because technology now has the capabilities to do as well or better what human beings have to do, doesn't mean that we will instantly see digital technologies replace the human beings. It's a process of social, cultural, political adjustment. A lot of the ideas that people are starting to have is that we need to work with the robots, with software, with automation, not against it. It's not a us versus them, it's a us with them. Rodolf Galin has a dream, to make a robot that is our most loyal colleague rather than our toughest competitor, a friend. Do robots make the best colleagues? We who love our robots, who make robots to help people, are convinced of it. In general, we'll use robots in our jobs to help us do our jobs better and only do what's needed to provide human added value. For example, robots will do the painful, heavy, repetitive work and humans will add their expertise where their eye or judgment is needed for the job, something that would be complicated to explain to a robot. What is your name? My name is Peppa. How old are you? One year old. I'm still really young. Who made you? I was designed in the offices of Aldebaran in Paris. My encounter with robots came through computing with programmable calculators before computers existed. I was fascinated by the intelligence you could encode in a machine. It was a shame that it was restricted to displays on tiny screens. There was no graphic interface then. So I wanted to make this machine move and show that computing intelligence could also move objects and affect the environment. How may I help you? Fluid communication with the robot is the main challenge. It's vital that this dialogue, mainly oral, but also physical, be perfectly fluid and function fully. Our robots must learn by themselves, using deep learning type techniques, so that the robot, throughout his life, working with a human being, should adapt and improve and be able to learn new tasks. We can't ask people to program a robot in a sophisticated language. When a robot is shown a task, it must watch, understand and repeat. Analyzing. Ideally, according to our vision, a robot should be completely integrated in our physical and also mental environment. A robot that is attentive to us, that knows our habits and hence can anticipate our needs and say, you usually drink a coffee at this hour, shall we go or shall I fetch one? It can also be, if the robot sees me print something, he fetches it. So, they're no longer objects we order around, they're objects who offer their services naturally. We had to break the cliché that robots are dangerous. Robots can bring us so many benefits that they have a place among our future colleagues. By mastering the tools we'll have in the future, we'll have the power to choose what role work should play in our lives. All the research we know about work, what, the one thing we know is that great work and being able to do tasks that people find meaningful and interesting is really at the heart of happy, satisfied lives. And that's really what the future should be focused on. I believe that the worker of the future is one that is going to have more choice. 
is because of five trends that we're seeing. Uh, mobility, globalization, uh, technology, millennials and changing demographics, and new behaviors. Uh, all of these things are coming together to create a perfect storm which puts the power in the hands of the employee. Let's hope that come 2050, we will all be able to seize that amazing opportunity.